consequence of Dr. Biggs not being here is that I'm having trouble. <laughs> I'm having trouble with my camera, so you all don't have to watch me today. Uh, but Paul, is the uh, the slide showing up okay? Yes, it, it looks fine. Yeah. Okay. Very good. So uh, yeah, I as uh, we've gotten quite a few questions over the last few months, as you can imagine, about uh, this idea of stretching the hay supply. And, you know, people look at this from different perspectives. Uh, some look at it as a way, perhaps, not to have to uh, liquidate as many cows. Um, you know, others look at it maybe as an opportunity uh, to stretch the, the forage they've got available just to get uh, through to winter. Um, on the other hand, some have been looking at this uh, idea of using concentrate feeds to actually reduce the need for forage as more of a, a way to improve enterprise flexibility. And that's kind of an interesting thought. Uh, obviously, that idea works better when feed grain prices are inexpensive. And we're in a period of time right now where they're you know, considerably more expensive than they have been over the last 10 years. So it's not going to be, and we'll call it a cheap or inexpensive option, but it may be a way that uh, one strategy that will work for several people. You heard from Harold Stevens last week about how he um, made this type of a program work and his operation stretching his forage supply by actually feeding the concentrate and the roughage which is the hay, uh, separately. And, and if you weren't able to join us last, last week, basically uh, Harold's strategy was to uh, put his hay out in a pen, uh, open the gate for the cows to, to walk into the hay feeding pen. He left them in there for 45 minutes, which we think approximates somewhere in the range of around six pounds of hay intake on average. Of course, you have to have adequate hay feeder space for those cows uh, to make that work because you don't want the timid cows missing out. Uh, but then after 45 minutes, Harold pushed his cows out of the pen. Well, actually, he didn't have to push them out. He just fed the grain portion of this ration or this diet outside of the hay pen. And uh, once he opened the gate to let the cows out to the grain, which, which was fed in bunks outside of the pen, uh, the cows come trotting out there, uh, you know, to consume uh, the concentrate feed. And he just shut the gate behind them so they would be let in then 24 hours later uh, to, to do the process uh, over again. Uh, so that, you know, that's one strategy. We'll talk just a little bit about that here today. Uh, but I, I want to get pay homage to uh, Dr. Kenneth Ng, who was, uh, he was a longtime feedlot consultant, and his wife, Caroline, had a real love for beef cows. And between the two of them, uh, over time, they, they decided that they wanted to encourage primarily the academic community to consider alternative ways to maintain cows. And so um, really what they did, uh, their real interest uh, was to go into a part of the country where a drought was occurring and purchase cows that were selling below their true value and take those cattle uh, to, you know, probably a rented. Sometimes they had a farm or ranch that they owned that they would take these cows to that had feeding facilities where they could manage the diet. Uh, but generally they would hire someone uh, to actually manage those cattle in, in more of a confinement situation. So, well, I suppose a lot of them were either receiving yards or, or feedlot, or again, uh, just kind of a farm, uh, farm facility with feeding pens and bunks and so on, maybe uh, feed storage and, and mixing equipment. Uh, but they were able to take advantage of, you know, the market, local market conditions and hang on to those cows until either the local conditions improved or marketed those animals somewhere else in the country later when their value, you know, where their value was substantially greater. Uh, so, you know, just the idea of adding flexibility uh, to an operation is, you know, another 
reason why people might consider to, you know, have a, a strategy like this or be at least be aware of it as an option. Uh, and with careful management, uh, concentrate feed certainly can be used to replace or stretch forage, uh, which is going to be probably most people's interest in a year like this. Here I'm going to show you a publication by the University of Missouri. This is actually available on their website, uh, Comparative Value of Net Energy. And so if you have uh, corn as the base energy feed source and they use soybean meal as the protein source, the comparative value of distiller dried grains, you can see there when corn's worth $7.15 and soybean meal's worth $422 a ton, Distiller's grains equivalent value is about $382 a ton. Now, I visited with my friend uh, Gray Highfill this morning, and he indicated uh, that the delivery price on rolled corn to the farm uh, in north central, northwest Oklahoma is going to be substantially higher than $7.15 a ton. So, this was University of Missouri's values that they published as of this morning. Uh, but it sounds like if you want to consider a delivered price for these feed commodities uh, in, in Oklahoma, that you might need to increase them by another 20 to 25 percent. And that's what I've done when we get to the ration example or diet example I'm going to share with you here in just a few minutes. I actually increase those um, uh, beyond the prices you see here. Okay, so just a few thoughts about limit feeding cows. Again, uh, uh, you know, the flexibility idea, it does provide a location and a, and a nutritional program for those cows other than pasture and, and therefore can be used any time of the year and increase the enterprise flexibility and certainly could be used to increase stocking capacity. Uh, another uh, good positive thing about limit uh, limit feeding cow program would be to maintain core genetics during drought without further damage in the rain rangeland. And as I mentioned, with uh, Kenneth Ng and Caroline's practice, uh, might also uh, be used to hang on to more cows so that you know you can take advantage of the eventual market improvement that may may occur. Uh, increased diet digestibility. Anytime you limit an animal's intake, generally speaking, uh, diet digestibility improves because there's longer room and retention time, and therefore you get more thorough digestion of the nutrients that are delivered there. Smaller visceral organ mass, and that equates to lower maintenance energy requirement. I'm going to show you in this example, uh, we're going to only going to be feeding these gestating cows somewhere in the neighborhood of about 50% of the amount of dry matter that they would normally consume. And when that happens, uh, gradually over time, those cows will have a little bit of a shrunk appearance to them. Uh, and that's because, you know, they're not full. And when they're not full, their uh, digestive system, the rumen, the large and small intestine gradually shrinks in its, in its uh, mass and, and size. And that leads to a, a reduced maintenance energy requirement because uh, those uh, visceral organ tissues, think of the, you know, the most of the large organs or all of the large organs are the most energetically expensive um, tissue in the body. And so that's how uh, this type of a program limiting feed intake actually lowers maintenance energy requirement. And maintenance is 70 to 75% of the energy used by beef cow year round. Uh, so in one of our uh, recent publications, we uh, demonstrated 79% reduction or 79% or uh, maintenance requirement compared to the published value that NRC uh, published. I think in this study here, uh, NRC says it's 77 K cows per kilogram of metabolic body weight. In this study, I believe it was 61 
kcals per kilogram of metabolic body weight is what we calculated maintenance to be. Uh, in a second study uh, we just published this year, uh, maintenance uh, was calculated in limit fed cows. Again, maintenance was calculated to be about only 83% of that same uh, NRC accepted value of 77 kcals. So in the experiments we've done, the experiments that were conducted at Texas A&M um, by Dr. Wickersham's group, uh, we've documented that limit feeding uh, substantially reduces that maintenance requirement. Also, you know, another, uh, um, I guess, fact that would also influence that is the activity on dry, dry lot uh, is going to be substantially lower compared to a cow, you know, walking around more uh, back and forth to water and so forth in a pasture. And that a lot of times this activity associated with, with movement or transportation uh, gets assigned to that maintenance portion, but that's also another factor. Uh, and if you think of it this way, when those cows are essentially confined, whether it be in a in a some type of a, of a pen or in a smaller um, uh, sacrifice pasture, it's going to enable broader application of technology, uh, assuming those cattle are relatively close to your to your set of processing pens. Synchronization, things like artificial insemination. Uh, utilization of feed additives because you have control of what they consume and you're you have the ability to mix feed additives uh, in the diet uh, and and these things we've talked about relative to limit feeding. Okay, so now we need a list of negatives and there are quite a few and they are substantial. This program is definitely not for everyone because as you can imagine, more intensive, management is required. You might think of it as you become a feedlot manager, essentially. Uh, time commitment, daily feeding, they have to be fed every day. There's none of this delivering range cubes three days a week or just or running out to check on the cows once a week. Uh, they have to be fed uh, every day. Uh, feed storage is going to be required. Feed mixing and feeding equipment. We'll talk just a little bit more about that. Uh, and then and then you have to have the facilities to be able to maintain those cattle in, whether it's a, a dry lot pen or whether it's a sacrifice pasture, and obviously bunks to deliver the feed, a watering system. If it's wintertime, you're probably going to need a windbreak. And if it's summertime, you're probably going to need to invest in some sort of a shade system if it's not already there in your facility. Okay, so I think the main point here, if you're going to truly stretch the forage portion of that ration and limit intake all the way up to as much as 50% of what they would normally like to consume, to make this work, you have to be able to control what the cattle eat and how much they eat. Uh, free choice access to grazing around bales does not work because you lose control. In other words, if you put a round bell in the pen, let's say, and you're feeding a concentrate in a, or let's say a total mixed ration, a mixed diet in the feed bunk, and, and you've got that designed to deliver 25 to 30% maybe hay or roughage in that mixed diet, but you're a little concerned about safety, so you go ahead and put a round bell out in the back of the pen. Well, some cows are going to consume a lot more hay and a lot less of, of the uh, mixed ration when you do that. And so you lose control. Some cows are going to consume mixed ration and then go tank up on, on the hay. And you're no longer limit feeding. They're going to go consume as much hay as they want. They'll be full. You won't get uh, the reduction in maintenance requirements that we talked about. Uh, so to make this program work, you have to be able to control what they consume. You can't turn them out on a pasture that has, you know, abundant forage quality available and feed a diet like this. Uh, once again, because you lose control, they're just going to go out there and graze through the through the afternoon, let's say, and uh, and graze until they're full. Uh, the roughage and concentrate portion ration can be the real a real challenge here. In a, in a mixed diet, but uh, due to the good work of Dr. Wickersham's group, 
uh, down there at Texas A&M, they've demonstrated that uh, you can successfully, you know, feed the hay or whatever type of roughage, silage, whatever, whatever it happens to be in your case. You can feed it separately. You can feed it at a different time of the day and then come back and feed the concentrate portion in in well in feed bunks but you can feed it in a different location like Harold Stevens was doing he's feeding the hay in the pen and then feeding the concentrate outside of the pen and bunks that works that works great um, if you're going to use processed forage uh, and a mixed ration you know obviously you're going to have to have a way to process that roughage a way to mix it and then you also have to have storage uh, for that process forage. Uh, this is our uh, vertical mixer. We've had it for several years now, I've conducted most of our uh, limit feeding research with this unit. It's an older unit, uh, 600 cubic foot uh, vertical mixer uh, designed to process hay. And it works really well for us um, to mix and deliver a TMR to our cows, uh, the you know if if you've gone out and priced one of these, you'll know that they're they are very expensive. The PTO powered trailer units are substantially uh, less expensive. But uh, anyway, that's that's kind of how we're getting our diet mixed. And even though this unit is equipped to process round bales of hay, uh, because of the inexpensive um cost of hiring a commercial grinder and the the way they can get it processed so quick uh just a i don't know a couple hours if even that they can do 50 to 60 bales uh we have our we've been having our hay chopped by a commercial grinder uh just a few things about storage uh and and the uh, flat storage versus overhead you know a lot of these a lot of ranches uh, that might be interested in this would have overhead storage that's going to work good for the for at least some of the concentrate portion uh this bin here is split so we can put i think we can get almost uh, well that's it's a full load in that bin so but it does have two compartments so we can get uh, two different commodities in there if we choose to use it that way. Uh, this is an older uh, Kuhn unit, a small horizontal mixer. Uh, it's, as you can see with the tractor there, it's it's a pretty old unit. We bought it very inexpensively and it's required, you know, considerable amount of maintenance. But if you're handy with equipment, you can probably get by. But my point here is that it's not a bad idea, especially if you have a bunch of cows that you're going to limit feed to have a backup plan. Because, you know, if, you're, if your primary piece of equipment goes down and you don't have a backup plan, you're going to be in trouble. Uh, so uh, that, you know, that's just another thing to consider. Relative to storage, uh, uh, this is a picture of a barn that uh, we kind of developed with the idea of eventually turning into a commodity barn. It, it, it's not really designed like a lot of the really nice commodity barns are today because we don't have a an eight foot um, concrete wall around here. We just put we just put these uh, panels, um, plywood panels up uh, to kind of well keep keep the feet off of the tin uh, and protect it a little bit from the loader. But here we've got. Uh, 20 foot by 40 foot base, two of them in this barn, and it works really well. Um, it's not fancy. Uh, we installed uh, this bay on this side. We installed later. As you can see, we don't have the concrete all the way down to the floor here. The cost of the concrete and the panels back here was about $3,000 at the time. I think it might be closer to 4,500 now. Uh, but, you know, if you're going to do something like this or improve an older barn or something, my suggestion would be for sure extend the concrete pad out here. This gets used a lot, and it also protects the feed somewhat to dirt and rocks and things like that. It doesn't protect it completely, but our uh, our 
the employees are really good about sweeping this clean every few days, just so we don't keep tracking more and more of those, well, we'll call them contaminants, rocks or whatever, into the feeding facility or, or into the feed itself. Uh, so, okay, so enough on that. Uh, the commercial hay grinding is more available today and it makes sense for small to mid-sized operations. Obviously, you have to have a pretty substantial uh, storage area to be able to grind quite a few bales of hay. Um, give me just a second here. There we go. This outfit comes from our, our area every couple of weeks. Uh, they charge a $50 setup fee and minimum of 35 bales. And so, you know, it's not, uh, we generally have them, I think our, our one of those bays of ours can hold somewhere around 40 to 45 bales and, and $8 per bale is what they charge. So, you know, if you're going to feed a ration that's only, let's say somewhere in the neighborhood of 30 to 50%, uh, forage uh, on a on a per ton of mixed feed basis that that really isn't too expensive. Okay, so just uh, another comment about dry rations, which many operations are going to you know most of the commodities they have access to. If uh, you're talking about rolled rolled corn or dried distillers or dried corn gluten feed, uh, maybe some you know farm raised and harvested hay it's going to be dry. And that's a, that's a problem for a mixed ration uh, because the cattle pretty quickly learn to toss that ration, burrow down in it with their nose and, and try to sift out the concentrate that kind of settles to the bottom in that feed bunk. And um, that sorting obviously can become a problem in terms of digestive upset, bloat and founder, if they're able to sort it to, to a very a large extent. We've been able to, or we our strategy has been uh, to address this, has been to provide a liquid uh, product. We've got uh, company supplied uh, large tanks. I should have should have showed you a picture of it here, but then we just built a, a little liquid feed shower that we drive the truck under and we we flip on a gas uh, powered pump and and pump the amount of liquid feed that is called for on that day works works very well for us. Uh, our ration is about seven and a half percent liquid supplement and that can range anywhere from five percent up to ten percent depending on the class of cattle that we're feeding and the you know the obviously the current formula of the liquid we have in the tank. Uh, but what works even better, uh, because it is very inexpensive, is to add water. Uh, and we've uh, our dairy here at Oklahoma State uses a ration where they add thirty-five percent water, so it's pretty wet coming out of that feet out of the uh, vertical mixer. Um, we've been adding somewhere in the neighborhood of twenty-five to thirty percent to this beef cow. Uh, diet and it works very well. It drastically reduces their ability to sort, and of course, the you know the ration is no longer dusty when you add that much moisture. Okay, just a few other things about feeding management in a program like this. Uh, this is this just an example showing 1,150 pound uh, mature cows. Um, somewhere in the neighborhood of the ration I'm going to show you is uh, to be delivered at at about 15 pounds on an as-fed basis per cow today. Uh, as-fed, actually before you add the water, I should, I should say that. Uh, so 15 pounds of, of dry feed, one to one and a quarter percent of body weight of dry feed with a cost uh, as I've got calculated as of this morning at about $2 per cow per day. Obviously you need to add Anything you want to include in there for a yardage fee or for an equipment depreciation fee and, and for labor. For a lactating cow, that'd be about 20% of that dry a ration before the water is added and with, at a cost of about 267, 270 for a dry cow. Now, you know, I don't want you to focus on my costs here. Obviously, everyone needs to find out what your delivered costs of these commodities would be. 
uh, and calculate you know, your own costs. I'm just providing this as an example. Uh, so far, we've had good success feeding once a day. We feed early in the morning every day of the week, obviously. Um, uh, but as I mentioned earlier, feeding time must be consistent. Uh, we try to feed uh, just a little after daylight every day and uh, try to keep that consistent. And thus far, if we do a good job of adapting these cows to a diet like this, whether it's lactating cows or whether it's gestating cows, uh, we just had good success and haven't had too much. I'm not going to say we haven't had any problems uh, with bloater founder. We've had just a little bit when we first got started, but uh, after, over a period of time, it seems like uh, we've gotten relatively good at that and just have not had very many issues from uh, the digestive upset standpoint. Okay, uh, you are going to need to adapt these cattle. You don't want to make big changes in their diet like this. You know, they're going to go from maybe you want to eat 30 pounds of feed and you're going to pull them all the way down to 15 pounds of feed. Uh, that needs to be done gradually. And you may be going from an 85 to 90, 95% roughage diet all the way down to a 30, let's say 30 to 35% roughage diet. So th this can be done. The adaptation can be done a lot of different ways. The, the Probably the key ingredient is to be gradual, right? Make that change gradual. Uh, here's an example of one way to go about it, one of many, uh, but that would be five days uh, with 40% hay and 60% your, of your mixed ration uh, and feed it at 2% of body weight. So you're already restricting the amount that they consume uh, because of a good quality diet, they're going to want to consume quite a bit more than 2% of their body weight. Uh, but we're starting to introduce the grain and we're starting to restrict the intake uh, at the same time. We we'll do that for five days and then for five additional days, drop the hay 10%, bump the mixed ration 10% and drop total feed intake a little bit more. And then on the last uh, five days, go to 2080 and drop the feed intake down to around one half percent of body weight. That's probably where you would stop. Actually, wouldn't you wouldn't go that low on a, on most lactating cows, uh, but you'd still be above where you're going to wind up on a gestating cow at around 1.2% of body weight, maybe 1.3. Okay, uh, cows need, uh, I think, a minimum of linear bunk space is 30 inches per cow. Uh, if you have lactating cows with calves in the pen with them, you're going to need more than that, 36 inches, because those calves pretty quickly at a fairly young age learn to come to the bunk and eat with the cows, um, especially more bunk space if those calves do not have a creep area. Feeding calves, we're feeding the same uh, diet to the calves as we feed to the cows, and we've had good experience in terms of calf performance. Uh, we've done a couple of projects where we fed the calves as much as they wanted to eat while the cows were in the pens, and we discovered, you know, that gosh, after, as you can imagine, after about 90 days, uh, those calves are really learning to eat a lot of feed on their own. And uh, they gain about three pounds a day and actually start to get kind of fleshy. So uh, we backed off in later experiments. Those two papers I just mentioned there, uh, we've been limiting uh, feed intake in the creep area to the calves at about one and a quarter percent of body weight. And they've been gaining around two and a half pounds a day uh, at that rate of feed intake. And this way, you know, of course, you only have one diet to deal with. Uh, calves can be weaned early in dry lot situation, and you don't want to have to keep managing the cows, calves in there with the cows, obviously. Uh, uh, a lot of times when we've used a program like this, we've tried to wean the calves at somewhere around 150 to 175 days of age. Okay, so in summary, uh, concentrate feeds can be used successfully to stretch forage. Uh, it's not going to be inexpensive this year. Uh, but I think, you know, one thing a lot of people are thinking about is how can I hang on to some cows with the anticipation that our market, you know, uh, if uh, the creek don't rise and all that, the market can be, uh, will be good here in the, in hopefully uh, the near future. 
Uh, intensified management is going to be required, so it's not all positive. Um, definitely, this is a program that's not going to work for everyone, but there are some people that can take good advantage of this if they're you know, willing to uh, think outside of the box, do things a little differently. Uh, can be used anytime, as I've mentioned several times, to increase uh, enterprise flexibility because at about any time of the year, you could pull cows into the dry lot if you have a program sort of worked out and you've, you know, developed your, your skills and experience to be able to manage cows this way, uh, much like uh, Dr. Kenneth and, and Caroline Ng did uh, several years ago and actually for a long time. They use uh, that kind of management to their advantage. So, okay, uh, Dr. Beck, do we have any questions at this point? I'll uh, And please do feel free to just type in any questions or comments and we'll try to get to them here. I'm going to stop sharing this and I'm going to pull up, uh, while we're working on the questions, I'm going to pull up uh, the calculator software program. Dave, we have one question from Brian Fracking. It says the 60 to 70 K cow maintenance values are based on dry cows. What would you expect those to be for lactating cows? Uh, the, uh, let's see, let me think about this for a second. The second study, um, which was 83% of NRC are actually, that's a lactating cow study. So it was one of each, one dry cows and one lactating cows as I as I recall so I I think it works it works just just as well now um uh, realize when I said 77 k cows NRC National Research Council says that maintenance requirement in beef cattle is 77 k cows um that applies to a gestating cow uh, NRC um accepted value for a lactating cow is 92.4 Okay, and our value in, in the lactating cow study was 83% of that. If that if that helps. Excellent. That's the only question we had so far. Okay. All right. Well, let me just show you real quick. Uh, uh, just kind of talk through an actual diet and uh, maybe associated costs with it. Uh, this is our uh, calculator. Uh, program, you can jump on beef.okstate.edu if you'd like to have use of, a, of this tool. You can download it for free. The only thing we ask of you is that you give us just a little bit of demographic data. We want to know uh, your zip code so we can kind of get an idea of about what part of the state you're coming from. We don't care what your address is or anything like that. We just want to know in general where are you from um, inside, you know, within, well, anywhere in the country or world as far as that goes, but, um, and then an email address. The reason we ask for an email address is so that when there's updates, we can let you know about them. And uh, uh, we also asked, you know, what, what, just a few demographic things like uh, what kind of cattle do you anticipate that you're going to use this for the most uh, and so on. Beef.okstate.edu. Okay, so these are the primary ports or uh, components in calculator. You've got a description of the cattle section. You've got a balancer where the majority of the quote balancing and diet evaluation work gets done. There's a feed list where you can go put your own feeds in here, your own feed costs. Uh, you can have a sample sent off of your hay or any commodity you purchase. Uh, when you get the results back, you can go to this. Uh, you can go to this feed list, and you can type in your own values here. And then, when you save the program again, it becomes your customized uh, feed library. Uh, the cattle page here. I'm just going to show you. Uh, I've got selected here. You can you can start here. You have to select the class of cattle you're going to be working with. Uh, I'm going to say mid gestation dry cows for this limit feeding example. We've got cows in here weighing 1,200 pounds in a body condition score five. And we'll say they started off in a five at the beginning of this 100-day feeding period. And when this 100-day feeding period is over, we want them to be in a body condition score five. So we're not going to try to put uh, flesh or body condition on the cows. We're just going to try to maintain them. 
at the same time, I'll show you here in a minute, we're going to include enough nutrients to grow that baby calf or that fetus. Uh, expect a calf birth weight, 75 pounds. That's really only important right at the end or the third period, uh, third trimester. Um, anyway, uh, you can and should select or kind of describe the breed of cows that you're working with. And all you need to do here is get, just kind of make an estimate. If you have crossbred cattle, you know, let's say they're 25%, approximately 25% Hereford, 25% Simmental, 50% Angus. Well, you just, just put those percentages uh, beside the breed that's appropriate. And the main thing is that you need to wind up with a value that's 100. Okay, here's the feed list. Uh, we will select feeds uh, from this list and pull them over here into the balancer page. This is the balancer page. There's a lot going on here. Uh, but really, uh, if, you, if you just focus on this section of the balancer page for now, we'll ignore this table to the right for the time being. And Dr. Beck, just tell me if you would just let me know that that's showing up okay. Um, I'm going to start off here and we're going to put, I've, I've already pulled in Bermuda grass hay full bloom, so kind of marginal quality hay. I'll just tell you, I've got it in the feed list at $125 a ton. Again, you need to go put your own value in there. When I looked up at, in the Oklahoma Agricultural Marketing Systems data on the hay market, uh, that was the value they gave recently for grass hay. So I've got it in there at $125 a ton. I've got the rolled corn in here at about $335 a ton, which is closer to what Gray Heifel indicated it might cost delivered to the farm in a truckload lot in his county. Uh, distiller's grains, uh, it's in there. It's in there at about, well, let's just go look. I don't, <laughs> I can't remember what I included. Okay, here we go. Distillers, grains, corn, I've got it at 355. I've got the, I oh, told you wrong. I've got the rolled corn in at 290. Uh, the, the distillers in at 355. Okay, so I'm going to start off with our, our ration that we've used here recently. Uh, and that's a, not quite a third Bermuda grass hay, a third rolled corn, and a third dried distillers. A really simple diet. Uh, then we have a, a little premix. Um, uh, you can do this in a dry premix. This one would be fed at 0.3% of the diet. Uh, and then we, in all of these diets, you need an additional calcium source because you've got distillers and corn grain, both are very high in phosphorus and low in calcium. So you have to offset that with additional calcium source. And, you know, you could... Uh, you can use several different sources of calcium, and I'm just using feed grade limestone here. Um, when you get all done with your ration, you speaking of calcium to phosphorus ratio, the standard rule of thumb in beef cattle nutrition is try to target for growing cattle, in particular somewhere around a calcium to phosphorus ratio of two to one. Here, I've got this up to a calcium to phosphorus ratio of one and a half to one. So it should be safe for cows. And there's some guidance there that says, it says with a range of 1.25 to three would be ideal. Uh, for growing cattle in particular, we're, we're gonna try to stick with that two to one rule. For cows, it's not nearly as critical, uh, uh, but uh, just thought I'd mention that. Notice, I've got uh, the feed delivery here in as 15 pounds as fed. Now we haven't added our water to this yet. So we're still talking about a pretty dry diet. In fact, if you look over here on this portion of the, the results of the diet or the summary of the diet, it's showing this diet as 90% dry matter, only 10% moisture. That's a pretty dry diet. But again, before we go feed this, we're going to add another 25 to 30 percent water to it. And so I, I probably should go ahead and put water in here. And so my as fed values are coming out uh, 
uh, so that, you know, that, whatever that turns out to be, we're going to be actually wind up feeding around 18, 18, 19 pounds feed as, as fed once we add that water. But I want to show you that this 0.5 and it's red, it as just an indicator that you're feeding considerably less than these cows would like to consume. Uh, this uh, feed intake ratio or the predicted intake you see right here on a dry matter basis is based on a cow's ad libitum consumption. In other words, how much based on the energy value in the diet and the cow's characteristics uh, that we put in back here on the cattle page, how many uh, pounds of feed dry matter does it predict they would consume? And it's, it's predicting 27 pounds. At 15 pounds of this diet before water's added, we're saying we're only going to deliver 13 and a half pounds of dry matter. And so we're only feeding these cattle 50% of what they would like to consume. And again, that's the reason those uh, the visceral organ tissue gradually shrinks over time and your maintenance goes down. Uh, notice that we have uh, good performance. Uh, the cows are actually gaining weight. Uh, the desired gain is 0.28. Where'd we get that from? Well, these cows are in mid-gestation, so that fetal tissue and the fetus is growing. And so uh, it predicts that it, uh, on average during mid-gestation, about almost three-tenths of a pound a day of weight gain needs to be uh, needs to be accounted for, I guess, or would be accounted for by that fetal tissue growth. The actual tissue or growth or weight gain uh, that the cow is recognizing is increasing her, whether it be muscle tissue or fat tissue or whatever, which, which would gradually increase her body condition score is 0.36 pounds. And so you add those two together and that's where you get a total average daily gain of 0.64. Okay, so that's how that works at half of their feed intake. This is an energy dense diet. Therefore, these cows are consuming little feed, relatively speaking, but still in a positive plane of nutrition. If you look over here on this side, over to the right, calculator gives you an idea of the different diet uh, components, the chemical components, and whether or not, uh, based on National Research Council uh, requirement predictions, whether or not those uh, different components are being met. Uh, let's say if we drop, let's say if we change this to, uh, let's say 50% corn, and then we drop down to about 18, we're going to just try to get it back down close to 100, 17. Uh, so here we're about back to 100, and notice we, we reduced the amount of hot, the protein-dense feeds source or commodity, which is dried distiller's grains. We increased, you know, a commodity that's only 9% protein approximately. And now we're deficient in protein. And so that's how that works. You know, the, the calculator program estimates these cows should be getting 2.2 pounds of crude protein a day. They're only getting 1.6 with that particular diet. And that's how you can sit around on a rainy day maybe and, and make yourself some money with a diet evaluation program like this, playing around with it, making sure you're adequate. Uh, so that's kind of all I've got there. If there's any questions, please uh, let me know. Uh, if, you're, if you don't have training and experience in beef cattle nutrition, even though a tool like this is handy and can teach you a lot about beef cattle nutrition, you probably do need to seek a professional, someone that has considerable experience with beef cattle nutrition. Your area livestock specialists, extension educators are good uh, at, at this. We work with them quite a bit on, on this, and, and a lot of them have tremendous amount of experience uh, working with these, uh, not only this program, but with, with uh, feeding strategies such as limit feeding cows. So just encourage you to contact them for assistance. Questions or comments, Dr. Beck? So uh, one thing you might touch on is uh, a little bit of the behavior of these cows when you're limited feeding like this. Sure. 
And you hear different things. Uh, I, Harold mentioned, Harold Stevens mentioned last week in our Ranchers Thursday um, lunchtime series that his experience was that those cows, when you start shrinking the amount of feed they're getting to eat every day, you know, they do, they do look shrunk and they act hungry. Um, our experience, my experience has been that that lasts for maybe, you know, maybe a day or two. And if you're gradually shrinking the amount they're getting, it's not even, it's not as noticeable. Our cows really settle down pretty quick and they, they learn the program and they sort of just get used to the idea that they're going to get fed once in the morning. Now, yeah, they're standing there at the bunk waiting for you to show up. Uh, in the morning and they're very aggressive eaters that seems like they learn to eat faster uh, in a limit in a limit fed program like this but you know if you're going to uh, implement a program Harold mentioned that you need to have good fences uh, and and certainly that is true you know they're they're not uh, especially early on uh, you better have you know pretty decent set of, of pins or a good fence you're not going to be able to do this with probably a loose 50-year-old three-wire fence with posts that are leaning. Good question. All right. Well, hey, thanks. Uh, appreciate everybody uh, coming to the, the Ranchers Thursday this week. Uh, I guess, Dr. Beck, the only other thing I might mention is that we have uh, all of these um videoed recorded they're on our website beef.okstate.edu if you jump on our website you scroll down just a little bit they're really easy to find and if you want to if you want to look at any of the segments that we've had for this series you just click on on the heading that says uh, uh wintering cows with limited forage i will include that in the chat I want to also point out we have one more session in this series, uh, December the 15th, and then we're going to take a break for Christmas. So with that, uh, we have one question that came in. Okay. Um, it's more of a comment. No hay. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, appreciate that, but uh, I understand that a lot of people are in that are in that situation. And I, I don't know if I mentioned earlier, but we realize that a lot of people have already, you know, depopulated to, to a great extent, but hopefully, uh, oh, and Dr. Beck, the other thing I ought to mention, I guess uh, I should have mentioned earlier, we do have a fact sheet on this that covers all of these details, maybe even in a little bit more detail. And so, you know, if you, I don't, I didn't think to pull up the number or anything, but it, you just Google limit feeding beef cows in Oklahoma or something like that. It'll be real easy to find. I'm sure we can include the link to that as well. Whenever we post the video from this. Good idea. Thank you very much. And with that, we really appreciate the uh, attendance today. Uh, if you have any questions, just feel free to contact Dave, I, or, or Dr. Biggs uh, at any time.